I want to share some things with you guys today, and um, it's about misunderstanding. Most people are one revelation away from a breakthrough. Most people in their Christian walk live one action away from a breakthrough. It's always the obedience of faith that activates the supernatural in our life. Jesus told the disciples, uh, he told his, um, the people at the wedding rather, to fill the, the pots up with water, pour it out, and then bring it to the governor of the feast. And so what happened is these people were not even born again. They were not even saved. They never tithed. They were just people. They were servants. So they obeyed God. And as they obeyed, they obeyed God, they, the miraculous was activated. And then the governor of the feast understood that there was a new government in town. You know, and so what happens is anyway, Jesus reveals himself and when he reveals himself, he reveals the kingdom that he lives from. That same kingdom is within us and it's really important that we live from the, the perspective of the kingdom because in the kingdom there's no lack. Because there's no lack, there's no competition. So I'm not trying to be greater than you or better than the next preacher or anything like that. I'm just comfortable in my own skin. I'm happy to be me. You know, and so that's it's really important that we get the heart of God, the mind of God, and we live from the kingdom toward the circumstances of life. Does that make sense? Most people are one revelation away from a breakthrough. Often people exist instead of thrive simply based on a slight misunderstanding. I will give you an example. Let's turn in our Bibles here. We're in church. We're definitely going to turn in our Bibles to Matthew 25, 14. There's a parable here where someone's misunderstanding uh, really turns out to be very crucial. Uh, it turns out to be detrimental. It turns out to be a major issue in this person's life. I want you to pay close attention to the whole parable, and then we're going to continue. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And one he gave five talents, and another two, and to another one one. And to every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. Then he had received the five talents, then, then he that had received the five talents and traded with them, and made them made another five talents. And likewise, he had received two, gained another two. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants comes and reckons with them. And so he received he who received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, you delivered unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into, joy, into the joy of your Lord. And he also had received two talents, came and said, Lord, what you delivered unto me, two talents, behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. He said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Then he which had received one talent came and said, Lord, I knew that you are a hard man, reaping where you have not sowed, and gathering where you have not strawed. And I was afraid, and went and hid thy talent in the earth. And here... Here is what is yours. His Lord answered and said unto him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I sow not and gather where I have not sowed. Thou oughtest therefore have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received my own with usury or with interest. Therefore, take therefore the talent from him and give it to him that has ten talents. For every one that has shall be given and he that have abundance but from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he has cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness where there should be weeping and gnashing of teeth the first thing we realize is that God is not a communist 
Hello? He's a capitalist. I'm just joking with you. You guys all right? You alive this morning? The first thing you need to understand about the kingdom of God is that the kingdom of God invests in people. That's what this is about. God made an investment in three men. Two of his investments were on fertile ground. One of his investments was not on fertile ground. Now, you have to understand, the kingdom, when the kingdom invests, it invests in people. People say, sow into our building project and invest in the kingdom. Listen, a building is nothing to do with the kingdom of God. Kingdom activity can happen from a building, but the kingdom of God is within you. You are God's primary and number one investment. He's concerned with you. He's not interested in buildings or in structures or in organizations. He's interested in people. His greatest investment is in people. You are His inheritance. You are His greatest investment. All that He has, He spent on you. You're valuable to Him. If he, Jesus is the type of guy that if He goes out to lunch, He's paying. Are you following me? Anyway, now, what happened is, so the two guys, right, they, they, um, they take a risk, they invest. Now, some people misuse this, this parable, uh, and they say, use your talents for the Lord. No, 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 this has nothing to do with talents. This has nothing to do with your skills. This has to do with money. The guy gives them money and says, invest the money. Investing in money, uh, anytime you invest money, you're taking a risk. Are you with me? Right? And so these guys, there's two guys that they're healthy. I want you to say this with me. Healthy people take risks. Healthy people take risks. If you want to gain something, you don't have to keep repeating. If you want to gain something, you have to be willing to take risks and you have to be willing to make an investment. There's a principle here that you have to understand whether it's financially, spiritually, whatever it is, if you want to gain you want to gain, then there's two things you have to understand that you have to be willing to invest and you have to be able to, you have to be willing to risk and there also comes a time where you have to invest and then wait. And while you're waiting, you're like living in this season of risk until your investment returns upon you and then you can make a decision as to keep investing, pull out, how you want to do what you're going to do with your money. You, are you with me? Anytime you're doing anything that's fast with money, it's not good. I know people that are very wealthy and they say any fast money is not good money. The book of Proverbs says that he who make, makes haste to be rich shall not be innocent. It talks about any, anything that's overnight usually doesn't last very long. Alright? Now, but I want, you, I want to uh, put our attention on what this servant's perception of his master... The servant's perception of his master was off. He said that you're a hard man desiring to reap where you haven't sowed. He had a faulty and incorrect perception of his master which caused him to be afraid and to live in fear. And fear, the number one thing that fear stops people from is fear stops people from taking risks. Faith is spelled risk. R-I-S-K. Faith. I'm not talking about presumption. Presumption and faith is different. Presumption comes from the soul of a man. Faith comes from the Spirit of God that comes through the Word of God that when God says something to us in His Word or to us through His Holy Spirit or to us through a believer, when God says something to us, that builds faith in us and faith always should lead to a corresponding action. That action will always have risk involved. Are you following me? So what happened was that this uh, servant had a false perception of his master and it winded up being to his own demise. This is a lot of people in church, a lot of believers, a lot of people have a false perception of God. They think God is angry. They think God is sitting in heaven with a fly swatter waiting to whack them. Like he's waiting for you to make a mistake so he can put it on HD video and put it on his YouTube channel. You know? People think they have a false perception of God because a lot of people have father issues. And when you have a father issue, what happens is sometimes you project that issue into your relationship with your heavenly father. And in reality, 
Our heavenly father is nothing like your earthly father. Even if you had a good earthly father, he's not that good. You, you understand? And so what happens is sometimes we project realities onto God and, and, and we impose realities in us into our relationship with God and it causes us, it like stunts our growth, so to speak. Are you guys alive today? All right. I hope this is making sense. If not, I don't know. Don't buy the CD. Now, um, so, and then he says, you know, he out of his mouth, he says, like, you're a hard guy. And then, you know what God says? He says, out of your own mouth, I'll judge you. Basically, this is the unfortunate reality. This is why our perception matters. What you believe about God is what you'll get from Him. What you believe about Him is what you'll get from Him. And if you have a, a misconception or a false conception about God, it will, it will hinder your ability to relate to Him properly. And if you don't relate to Him properly, you won't receive what you need from Him. And you'll cut off your supply. Uh, your, the, you will cut off yourself from His supply. This happens in relationships and friendships. This doesn't just happen with our relationship with God. It does happen with our relationship with God, but this also happens in our relationship with people. If I don't honor someone correctly, let's say, then what happens is I cut myself off in my ability to receive what they have that I need. Right? So let's say I'm supposed to have a good relationship with Pastor Fred, but let's say I don't have respect for him. That means that I will cut myself off from what I need to receive from his life through not honoring him. When you honor someone in a healthy way, what happens is you have access to what God put in their life that's good, that you need. Honor is one of the keys to promotion in the kingdom. I'm not talking about idolatry or idolizing people. I'm talking about honestly respecting and genuinely honoring someone for who they are and, and gleaning from their life that which you need. This happened with Jesus. Jesus was doing miracles, was doing healings in his hometown. And they go like this to him. They go, aren't you Joseph's son who was born a year before they got married? They didn't say that, but that's what they were saying. Aren't you Mary's son, uh, the carpenter? And you know what? Paul says, I know no man after the flesh. They chose to relate to Jesus after the flesh based on their misunderstanding of him and it cut themselves off from the supply of what he had that they needed. That happens all the time in church. A lot of times, um, God puts what you need right in front of you. Look around. Look around. A lot of times, what you need is in someone else right next to you. The question is, will you recognize it? Will you honor them? Will you respect them in spite of their weaknesses? And will you relate to them based upon God's grace upon their life or based on their weaknesses? Because if you want to relate to me through my weaknesses, you're probably not going to like me. And if I want to relate to you through your weaknesses, I probably won't like you. But what happens is if we relate to each other through the grace of God that is toward us through Christ and we relate to each other in a healthy way, then I can extract what I need from your life, and you can extract what you need from my life, and we can properly relate to one another. And as we properly relate to one another, and that happens in the context of a church, what happens is an authentic community is built. And people want to be a part of it. It's like unstoppable. Could you imagine if people really loved each other, if people really cared for each other, if people like really had each other's back, like if we said like really, no one's car is getting repossessed. No one here is ever going to be evicted. No one here is ever going to be stuck with a medical bill they can't pay. No one here is ever going to, and imagine if the church, right, made a commitment like that to one another. That's what it would be like if we obey Jesus. <laughs> right? I'm saying that we need to rightly understand the Lord and we need to rightly relate to people. And when, we, when we're healthy, when someone is healthy on the inside, healthy, there's not a lot of healthy people, but when someone is healthy on the, in the mind and the heart, they're healthy, healthy people know how to relate to people. 
and they don't enter into relationships with false expectations, that's what happens. People come to church, they have come with a false expectation, and that expectation is not met, and they leave disappointed. They go from a big church to a medium-sized church to a small church to a house church to no church. And what happens is everyone in all of those places is all the same. They have weaknesses. They have issues. But what happens is if someone doesn't choose to relate to people right and understand the circumstances with they're in, they'll be bitter, they'll be angry, they'll be disillusioned. So how you relate to people matters. And often how we relate to people is first translated in how are we relating to God. Are you, are you understanding me? If my relationship with God is tight, my relationship with people should be healthy. You can't tell me that you have a rock-solid relationship with God, but you don't, know, you, know, you don't know how to relate to people. It's easy to say, I love God. It's, 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 it's even harder to flesh that out and learn to love people. You know what I'm saying? It's not, it's not the same. Anyway, um, I want to... Uh, I want to continue on with this, this similar concept of understanding and perceiving correctly because I, I really believe, my, my thing is like, I really like to see the light go on in people. Um, I, I got to say it's probably one of the, my, my greatest joys in ministry because it's like in ministry, like you go out and we'll go overseas and people get healed and saved and people get healed and saved in America. And I like that. But I think that the thing that really like I get a lot of satisfaction with in a healthy way is when someone gets it for themselves and they no longer need to be codependent on someone but they can stand with Jesus and then be a, a thriving member of the community instead of like a leech you know what I mean there's sometimes people that are like really needy and they're like leeches and then no one wants to be around them because they're like that but nobody cares enough to tell them the truth you know, they'll just talk about them in a prayer meeting or something. Well, maybe you need to just tell the person, yo, you're a leech. And maybe if you change, people would like you. <laughs> I mean, I know that sounds rugged or whatever, but Jesus says some pretty gangster stuff. So anyway, <laughs> anyway, all right, let's go to um, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. I want to, um, I'm going to give you, just to let you know, um, Whole entire books of the Bible have been written from someone to other people based on that group of people's misunderstanding of a certain truth. The book of Thessalonians was written to the Thessalonians because they thought they missed the return of Jesus. One. Second Peter and First Peter was written from Peter to uh, about Gnosticism. Gnosticism is the very spirit of Antichrist. And what that is, is <clears throat> they said that Jesus, listen to me, didn't come in the flesh, meaning that Jesus was a spirit, but not a person, like, you know, person, blood, right? And so what happened was, and you know why, you know what the core reason that they said that? The reason that they said that was because the Gnostics believed that the flesh was bad. Flesh was bad evil flesh is bad that's what they believed so they would say how can God come in the flesh so what they did is instead of believing the truth they fabricated a lie to fit in with their other lie but it, their other lie wasn't really a lie it was a misunderstanding in other words it wasn't necessarily a malicious lie like did you do something and you lie to someone maliciously it was based on a misunderstanding of the flesh. Their understanding was that the flesh was bad. So they said God is good. They would figure that. So if God is good, then God doesn't come in the flesh because flesh is bad. So they created a, a whole entire... Anyway, 2 Peter, 1 Peter was written to, uh, to unmask that lie. Okay? So I'm, I'm saying this for a reason that uh, Paul the Apostle, Peter, these men took time to carefully write. Uh, Paul wrote to the Galatians, um, who bewitched you. Was it Galatians? Yeah. Who bewitched you? In other words, the mixture, the Judaizers were mixing um, the Jewish law with the grace of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ and it was a mixed thing and it's weird and I honestly think some of the messianic stuff is a little bit like that but it's not fully like that 
Um, there's some Messianic uh, people that really take things to another degree that's off. And then there's Messianic believers that are on and they have a tremendous amount of insight about the Jewish culture and the body of Christ needs that and I affirm that and I agree with that. I think there's guys that are great like I think Robert Stearns is a great guy. He has a, a Messianic slant to him and I think there's certain people that are great. But I think other people take it to the extreme. I'm not going to name any names but I'm just saying that other people take that to an extreme that's not healthy and there is a, it's like a, a subtle it's just a little bit too much of a focus on Jewish and not enough focus on like where we are right now in, 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 in history. Anyway, now, um, I want to talk to you a little bit from 2 uh, Corinthians 4, Ephesians 2. And I want to um, tie it together because there is a misunderstanding that a lot of Pentecostals, specifically Spanish Pentecostals, I think specifically, um, I think it's more like Puerto Rican and Dominican. I get to go all different places. I'm not saying this haphazardly. I'm saying this because I know this. There's a lot of legalism in some of those churches. Is what I'm saying true or is it not true? Is it true that some churches they don't have, they don't let women shave their legs? Some of them women need makeup. You understand what I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> Just joking with you. You all right? I love you. I know how to duck too, so I, I can dip and move in it. All right. So anyway, it's okay to laugh. So what happens is you have these very genuine, sincere people. They're sincere. They love God. They're sincerely wrong. Sincerity doesn't make you right. You can do the right thing. There's two kinds of people. People who do the right thing with the wrong motives to get the wrong results. And then people who who do the wrong thing with the right motives and then eventually figure out what they need to really do. And then there's people who do things based on a misunderstanding and God brings them in, into the journey of all truth. They begin to walk with Jesus and they begin to realize, no, what I thought before just isn't true. Like there's things that I said that I probably regret saying because now I realize that they're like half true. When I said them, I was fully convinced that they were the truth. I was like, yes, this is true. But in reality, as I grew and as I matured and as I, I realized that, that's not fully the truth. You know what I'm saying? And so sometimes we can focus on a half a truth or, or anyway. To make a long story short here, I, there's this thing of in legalist Christianity, there's this thing of like money is bad, Right? People who have money are bad. Rich people are bad. It's like a demonization of people who have money. And then there's the opposite extreme that God is not pleased with you unless you have money. Those are both lies. There's, there is true prosperity that is of the Bible. And then there's manipulated people who hold the word of God deceitfully for their own gain. Okay? That's a, that's a lie. And then the legalist lie that, you know, you need to be poor because you're humble. That's a lie, too, because I know poor people that are arrogant. And so I know humble people that are, I know really rich people that are incredibly humble, that if you sat down with them, that you would never know that they're multimillionaire. You would never in a million years sit down with this person and say, this guy is a multimillionaire. And he's a humble, easygoing guy. You would never know. So money doesn't have to define us. But um, I want to share this because I think that we have uh, a short-term vision and a misconception of the future because we have a misunderstanding about the present. If I told you today, is the world getting worse or better, many of you would say the world is getting what? Worse. Perfect. Got you. All right. The world is not really getting worse. 150 years ago, there was no Christians in the Dominican Republic. Is there any Dominicans here? I love that place. My wife and I went there on our honeymoon. I've been there preaching many times. 150, I was in a Dominican uh, pastor's conference and I said, is the world getting better or getting worse? They go, worse! And I'm like, huh, okay, this is a setup. And I go, no, it's not. 150 years ago, there was zero Christians in the Dominican Republic. Right now, there's about a million. I said, is the world getting better or is it getting worse? 150 years ago, there was no multimillionaire Christians who were writing books in America that was selling hundreds of thousands of copies. Now there is. Baseball players who are multimillionaires who go and transform communities that they came from.
In Africa, 150 years ago, zero Christians. Now, 700 million Christians. Now, in India today, people are getting saved in an ungodly rate. It's so raw that what's happening is so serious that they have a Hindu government who controls the statistics of what's really happening, and the Hindu government refuses to tell people how many people are getting born again. In China today, 20 to 30,000 people every single day are getting born again. Which supersedes everything in the book of Acts. And, and true historians and true church people who are smart, who know the truth and who know the stats and who know things that are not hype, will tell you that that clearly supersedes what happened in the book of Acts, clearly. The other day I was standing uh, in uh, Liberty University. Have anyone been there? Liberty University, we're in Virginia. It was like the evangelical Vatican. We're standing on top of a mountain. It was huge. It literally almost as far as your eye can see was possessed by, was owned, is owned by godly people, Christian people, who came there with nothing and saw a university and, and, and prayed it in and worked it in and fleshed it out. And almost as far as the eye can see, they develop land. They own everything. It's insane. I was like, are you kidding me? They're like, no. And we went in their bookstore. Their bookstore even has Starbucks in it. And they own it. I'm like, dang, this is great, you know. I don't want to be, this is, like, this is like in between heaven and earth somewhere, you know, in Virginia. But anyway, the point of what I'm saying is, five minutes ago you told me it was getting worse. Right? I'm not judging you. I'm saying I, saw, I thought the exact same thing until someone forced me to look at reality. And then I realized that my perception was skewed. And my perception of reality was formed by media that is a lie. 